Hello, it's Scott Manley here. If all goes according to plan this year, we should see the first flight of Sierra Nevada's Dream Chaser. NASA wants to use this little space plane to deliver cargo to the space station and return cargo from the space station back to Earth. Now, I know that SpaceX's Dragon can already do both of these, but Dream Chaser offers a more gentle return environment with lower G-forces and a return to a conventional airfield where stuff can be offloaded relatively quickly compared to, say, SpaceX's Dragon, which has to be landed in the middle of the sea, recovered, and then the experiments can be offloaded. The spacecraft getting prepared for flight has been named Tenacity, and there is a great video showing it getting assembled. One thing to note is that the panels on the top are easy to remove so that they can actually get in underneath it and access the systems, whereas the heat shield on the bottom tends to be uh, much more securely fastened, let's say. The two control fins, which extend out the side at the rear, are mounted on specialized hinges that allow them to fold up when the spacecraft is placed inside the launch fairing, and they will then be folded out once the spacecraft is in orbit. While many early renderings of Dream Chaser showed it sitting on top of a rocket without a fairing, this is a cargo build, which means they don't need to worry about launch abort scenarios, so they can place the spacecraft inside a fairing and not worry about the aerodynamics. Dream Chaser is supposed to be the second payload to fly on ULA's Vulcan Centaur, so that puts the earliest flight of this uh, round about the summer of this year. Now, while this fuselage is what's going to come back to Earth, there is going to be a second module attached at the back. So you can see the mating adapter at the back of this. This module is called Shooting Star, and it provides extra storage space for cargo. It provides a place to mount unpressurized cargo around the outside, and it will have solar panels which are used to power the spacecraft while it's on orbit. And while this vehicle here is undergoing stress tests on the wings, you can see that they've got a few of the black heat shield tiles mounted on top. Uh, it's really obvious from this point of view that there is this bulge that comes forward. It was originally designed to carry people and therefore had to have a cockpit with forward view. That's no longer the case, but they've kept the design, presumably because it gives them a bit more room and because they've already done all the math for the aerodynamics and they don't want to have to go and spend a whole lot of time to re-optimize that. Although, interestingly, they just posted this image a few days ago showing DC-201 on the right. That's supposed to be a human version, and that has lost the cockpit hump altogether. It also has a lot more engines and little stubby wings, which I'm presuming would help it in an abort scenario. But that's some hypothetical future, possibly part of Orbital Reef. For this year, we are expecting, hopefully, a launch to the space station. It'll be the, the Dream Chaser with the shooting star on top of a Vulcan rocket. Well, with, the, I think, four solid rocket motors. Now, officially, they said they are booster agnostic, which means, in theory, they could fly on a Falcon 9. Uh, it's also possible that they may fly on an Ariane 6. Now, if I understand correct, the propulsion system is pretty interesting because they use dual mode thrusters. For low thrust, low performance, they can use hydrogen peroxide as the, the main propellant. But if they need higher thrusts, then they can add in RP1. So you have hydrogen peroxide RP1, they get more thrust, more performance, which makes sense given the amount of time the little Draco thrusters end up firing for deorbiting. So they don't use a docking port, they use a common berthing adapter in the back of the shooting star. That means they maneuver close to the station and then have the Canadarm 2 move the spacecraft in and out of its docking port. Once the spacecraft has finished its mission, it can dump the shooting star. Or hypothetically, they could leave that on orbit as an autonomous vehicle to perform your know, more science. Now, the design of Dream Chaser is actually a fascinating story that goes back to the very earliest days of NASA. Remember that NASA is the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. That means that aeronautics comes before space. Before NASA even existed, the US Air Force had created the Dinosaur Project because, well, the Air Force wanted to fly to space, and so they thought naturally using a winged vehicle would be the way to go. They even worked with NASA's predecessors, NACA. 
Soon after NASA was founded, it was decided to use capsules instead uh, for the US space program because it would be so much easier, the dynamics would be simpler than a winged vehicle. The US Air Force continued to work with the X-20 dinosaur. They even had Neil Armstrong as a test pilot, except they never actually built anything that flew. And the program would be shut down in 1963. But NASA was still very interested in the possibility of improving on space capsules for re-entry, and they went and looked at a concept called lifting bodies, basically aircraft which didn't have wings. The idea is that you could have a blunt body which would go through re-entry, have the nice high drag, low thermal impact properties that you get with a space capsule, and then at some point inside the atmosphere, this could turn into an aircraft using that bottom heat shield as its wing. So they started out with a mock-up called the F2M1. This was, you know, metal frame with plywood over, over the top, and it didn't have any propulsion. Instead, it was towed behind a car. The tow car was a souped-up 1963 Pontiac Bonneville convertible, and they were able to tow it at over 100 miles an hour for 400 test flights before they were ready to get it in the air, for real. They flew 77 flights uh, up to 10,000 feet. And yeah, I, I did say that they had a pretty cool car towing this. This aircraft... Um, it was nicknamed the flying bathtub for obvious reasons. It's interesting that if you look at the canopy, there's a glass window at the front so that the pilot can look down between their legs and see where the runway is for landing. So with the lifting body concept proven, they commissioned Northrop to build the M2 F2, which would be all metal and carried by a B-52 to 40,000 feet. So they would drop it and it would go nose down and proceed to glide at about 405 knots in a descent. It would take about three minutes to go from full altitude to the ground. And before they pancaked into the desert floor, they would gracefully lift the nose, bleed off speed and come into landing at about 175 knots or 320 kilometers per hour. Now, it did include an engine, a Reaction Motors XLR-11, which is the same that was used on the X-1. Unfortunately, before they got to the power tests, they had a crash landing, which lots of people saw because it was included in the opening credits to the TV show The Six Million Dollar Man. And they did indeed rebuild it better, faster, stronger. They took the fuselage, they modified it, they added an extra vertical fin to add a control authority they thought they were missing, and they finally got this through to actual powered test flight, where it was able to fly supersonic and then demonstrate gliding landings. They carried out 27 test flights from June of 1970 to December of 1972. The highest they got was over 70,000 feet. The fastest was Mach 1.6. Now, while they were doing the whole rebuilding better, faster, stronger thing, there was another aircraft they built called the HL-10. HL because it's horizontally landing and 10 because it was the 10th iteration that it flew with. It had the same engine, a broadly similar concept to its design, but it had a different control surface layouts, slightly different body lines, and ultimately it would fly higher and faster than the M2 F3. Finally, there's Martin Marietta's X24A, which was modified into the X24B. So, this was all the work that was done on lifting bodies, and then, of course, the space shuttle came along and they decided to put wings on it. So this stuff sort of ended up on the back burner. It was understood that this was a great configuration for re-entry, but the US was focusing on bigger things, mainly the space shuttle orbiter. But the Soviet Union had their own research programs around uh, lifting body aircraft. This is the MiG-105. It was nicknamed Lapot, which apparently is like a type of wooden shoe, and specifically referring to that upturned nose feature there. So in 1983, they start launching test articles called BOR-4, and these are launched into orbit, and then they perform a gliding return where they are recovered in the ocean. And it was there that an Australian Air Force P-3 Orion was able to photograph it. These images make it back to the US and the engineers at Langley get really interested in the design. And so they start building their own mock-ups, 
testing them in the wind tunnel and they find that they have many properties that make them superior to the previous lifting body designs that NASA has studied. In 1989, they begin to develop this into a full vehicle called the HL-20, obviously playing homage to the HL-10. They spec'd out a design that could carry 10 astronauts. They built flight simulators that showed that, based upon the measurements that were taken in the wind tunnels, that they could indeed produce a flyable vehicle that could make pinpoint touchdowns. They built a full-size version that they could use for human factor studies to make sure that the crew could load and unload and, you know, it would actually make sense as a vehicle. It was argued that this would be a far more sensible and cost-effective way to deliver crew to Space Station Freedom. Then there was the HL-42, which was 42% bigger than the HL-20. But ultimately, none of these were developed into flyable vehicles because the Soviet Union came into the International Space Station and provided the Soyuz spacecraft as assured crew return vehicles. And then in 2006, the Dream Chaser was born, or rather... The HL-20 was reborn. I mean, the mock-up that Space Dev brought to their press conference was basically the mock-up of the HL-20, which had been repainted. So Dream Chaser does have a lot of Soviet aerodynamic design in its heritage, but it has a lot of, you know, US design in there as well, I'm sure. So I'm hoping we get at least one flight this year, uh, maybe even two. Uh, also, I've seen a lot of people saying that this is, you know, some sort of glorious return to, you know, the days of space planes. And I would like to point out that those days never left. The X-37B has been going strong these last 10 years since the space shuttle retired. And in fact, has clocked up more time in space than the space shuttle ever did. It is, however, the debut of the first operational spacecraft that uses a lifting body design. An idea which took over six decades of research to happen. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.